our presenters, as Jesse mentioned, uh, two of them are Cody, Cody Looking Horse and Makasha Looking Horse, who are the son and daughter of uh, Chief Orville Looking Horse of the Lakota Nation. And their mother is also a presenter for tomorrow, and that is Dr. Dawn Martin Hill. She'll be presenting at the same time tomorrow on a co-creation of indigenous water quality tools that she's been working on with her position at McMaster University. And our third presenter is Aaron Wise, who has been very instrumental in a number of direct action uh, undertakings throughout North America. Uh, Standing Rock, Line 3, a number of, uh, a number of uh, social justice issues as well. She's award winning. And I'm going to introduce each of them uh, individually as they come up. Uh, but I just want to give you a brief outline of who, who we're going to be listening to. So first up today is going to be Cody Looking Horse, and he is currently, just recently hired, as the Indigenous Friendship Association Social Media Coordinator. So Cody is an actor, an influencer, and he's been very uh, active with such things as the Dakota 38 ride in, uh, in uh, the traditional territory of the Lakota, as well as a number of other activities that he's going to be talking about. So please welcome Cody Looking Horse. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, I traveled from Six Nations, Canada, Ontario. That's where I reside. Um, and I'm very honored to be speaking in Treaty 6 territory. And it's great to meet you all. I usually open up my presentations with my Lakota introduction. I have been taking Lakota language classes for the past four years. Confederacy <coughs> Hamecha. <coughs> Uh, hello, everybody. I said uh, I shake your hand with a good heart. I am from the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and Six Nations Con Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I hope you're all having a great day. And I am 24 years old. Um, so yeah, I am Cody Looking Horse, and I am social media coordinator with Outreach for Indigenous Friends Association. That's a really great association if you want to look it up. It's they do amazing work to uh, for indigenous youth to reach their further in their autonomy. <coughs> so yeah, I was actually asked to sing a prayer song. Um, that's what I like to do just to like, you know, get the energy up. Um, and this prayer song is a prayer song that, you know, that I really kind of resonated with. Um, and I can translate it when I'm singing it. And I mean, when I'm done singing it, but daku heheku means uh, whatever happens, happens, and that's just something I've really uh, resonated with because nothing's written in stone, you know what I mean? Oh, <coughs> <laughs> Oh. <coughs> um, so, means uh, hear my cry. 
Dakhu he heku means whatever happens, happens. And that is kind of just a prayer song that was created uh, around uh, my Lakota, Dakota people for hope. And, you know, in these days, it's really hard to have hope and faith. And, you know, when I get at my lowest, you know, that song's really special to me because that's something I sing in my own time, in my spare time, uh, when I uh, feel just kind of hopeless. And, um, you know, I hope that gives, you know, the energy what it gives to me. And it's online, and I hope that, you know, we all can take something from this conference. You know, I hope that we all can uh, rejuvenate and, you know, really help one another. And that's one thing that I've learned um, on my journey through the movement. And so I'm going to be talking about, you know, um, No Dapple and the Standing Rock uh, protest that had happened in 2016. I was 17 years old when this had happened. And, um, you know, it really shaped and changed my life. Um, and so basically, my journey into the movement started in 2016. And it was youth led. So at the same time, it was uh, global and national uh, protests from people from all over came to come and support my Lakota, Dakota people when uh, we called out for help. Because, you know, like many other uh, reservations, a pipeline went through our sacred homelands of the Lakota, Dakota. And it was actually, my grandmother is from Standing Rock. And um, so basically, I was living in Six Nations. And I was working at Tim Hortons at Lisheim. And I just, you know, I was actually 16. And then um, I turned 17. And I just, you know, felt the need to go out there because I was living so far away and there's just so much, um, I was just watching on TV about the um, what would be happening. Uh, there was like pregnant women, when the pregnant woman got bit by a dog, that was, you know, my, my, you know, my heart hurt for her. And, you know, it's just that this is what they're doing in 2016 and, um, you know, I just really, I, you know, told my manager, I was like, I'm quitting my job because I don't know when's the next time I'm going to come back. And I don't know if I'm going to come back because I'm going to go front fight for my people. I don't know if this is, you know, what's going to happen. At some point, you know, we didn't know if it was going to end in bloodshed because they had, um, you know, tanks, rifles, sniper rifles. They had everything on us. And I've seen my people get hurt. Uh, get knocked off horses, uh, and you know I've had I've seen youth bleed out. Like it's just something really traumatizing that never really leaves you as a person. And it was just basically re history repeating itself on the same Papa Lakota Dakota land that had you know bloodshed before. And I didn't want that for my people. So when I went there, you know I went there with the mindset, and basically um, I you know, went there and I knew where my place was. Um, I, you know, basically, um, I went straight to the uh, healing tent where everybody that was on the front lines, that whenever they got pepper sprayed, I was that person to put, you know, that white stuff on them. Uh, so, you know, they, they would feel better and just kind of like remind them, this is why you're doing this. You're fighting like warriors like our ancestors once did. We're protecting our land. We're land defenders, you know, when you call ourselves, you know, we're survivors, you know what I mean, of a genocide that has been placed upon our people and that is still upon our people to this day. And I was, you know, 16 when I realized how corrupt um, basically the government is. We're, you know, like at that, till that point, I thought, you know, we were protected. You know, that's when I knew that when, um, there was, they were doing tactics in North Dakota Cannonball, and there was uh, like the KKK going after our indigenous people in Bismarck. Um, my mom actually was verbally attacked. Me and my family were verbally attacked multiple times at hotels, saying that we need to go home, we need to get jobs. But my mom is the first indigenous woman in Canada to get a PhD. But do they know that? No. They see this as, you know, these savages, these Indians that don't, 
have nothing better to do. So that's when I realized that on my journey as an indigenous man, you know, I'm very much stereotyped everywhere I go. And when I walk, you know, when I'm walking through parking lots, I hear cars door lock, you know what I mean? And that's what they see as a threat. But, you know, my biggest thing is to bring peace among our people, you know, and that's something my father has uh, worked for. Um, he changed the name to, from Devil's Tower to Mato Tipula, Arvo Looking Horse. And that's Bear Lodge, and that's how you originally say uh, our name, the Lakota, has given. It's not Devil's Tower. The reasons why it's named Devil's Tower is because um, back in the day, we used to do sun dances at Devil's Tower, quote unquote. And they, seen, they demonized it as, you know, we're heathens, that we're not supposed to do these, we're outlaws. So, um, yeah, basically that other photo was my friend uh, Mega May. And um, she was a really good warrior there, and we're actually able to count coop um, on the natives. I mean, the natives were able to count coop on the police people, and that's what we did to our enemies way back in the day. We would go and uh, basically ride up to them and count coop and then run back. And we were able to do that. So, you know, we had some victories also uh, with what was going on. And that was the highest ranking honor that, you know, a Lakota warrior could get is count coup on your enemy. Um, so there is that. <coughs> and uh, no matter what they ever do to us, we must always act for the love of our people and do for the earth. We must not react out of hatred against those who have no sense. Um, so, yeah, it's just kind of like, I don't know, you know, what they're thinking when they're tear gassing Native people that are standing up for their land. You know what I mean? Like, what is going through their minds? Because they're, how can you protect a pipeline that's going through an Indian burial ground, place where my ancestors have been, you know, basically uh, buried for thousands of years? So, yeah, it was actually such a, an emotional time in 2016. And um, I want to, I like to talk about it because, you know, it's something that shaped my way into the movement and to what happened because, like, it happened at such a young age, but at the same time, it's so important to not forget about what happened, the brutality amongst my people that happened in 2016, and it's still happening to this day in Wet'suwet'en. It's still happening to this day in British Columbia. Um, so, yeah. Earth Guardians panel in Arkansas 2019. So from that point on, I was really inspired to spread awareness about the injustices in our indigenous communities. I have been asked to keep speaking with so many bright young change makers. Through my advocacy work, I have met so many great people working on with organizations like International Indigenous Youth Council, Earth Guardians, Earth Rights, and more. Because, you know, like so all these organizations really like at the same time, our platforms for indigenous youth to actually come and speak at these really good places. Um, because, and the reason why I do this work is because I don't think my grandmother and my grandfather ever got asked to speak at these, you know, platforms at these indigenous spaces. So when, you know, we as indigenous people, we should take these opportunities because, you know, we need to actually you know, either remind or like not forget what happened, you know what I mean, back then, 200 years ago, what happened at Wounded Knee, what happened at the Dakota 38, if you've ever heard of the Dakota 38. Um, it was the largest mass hanging in um, US history that happened to my Dakota ancestors. <coughs> so do not be afraid to speak out, speak your mind, because you matter. This happened, um, this photo was taken at a land back action and peaceful protest in Brantford, Ontario. It was, um, if you guys ever heard of land back lane that happened in Six Nations because uh, Caledonia kept on trying to take our land. They've over breached their land so much times, just like as you may know, our treaties are broken time and time again. And you know, when we stand up and fight back, that's when they bring in the army, that's when they bring in the US laws. And just like that, just like, that's the seventh Calvary to us. When they're coming, you know, these blue coats are coming because we're defending our land, we're defending our rights as indigenous people. 
if we read our treaties, they've broken almost every single one. And that's their own treaties that they wrote up. So we know that we cannot trust these people. And that's what our first ancestors once said when they brought these treaties. Um, you know, it will bring destruction among our people, among just not our people, our land. They polluted our minds and polluted our um, land. This was at the Col Colorado climate strike. I was asked to do, and um, basically I flew out there and with the International Indigenous Youth Council, and I just love um, the people and the organizations that I'm actually able to work with because it's just so amazing to see so many different Indigenous youth in so many different places and provinces and countries uh, working towards the same thing, working to protect our land, working to protect our minds. So, um, yeah, working with the industry, I've actually, uh, we are the most seen in human history with the movies and whatnot. Um, a lot of my people are going into movies and basically this, I was actually, did a, uh, wrapped up a movie two months ago that's gonna be on the History Channel. It's gonna be about the Battle of Little Bighorn. And um, yeah, it's basically, we are being the most seen. So it's basically up to us on what we do on our platforms and our, as influencers. So I choose you know, to educate people because you know, I was actually born into this. This is not something that happens to us. This is not something I just see on the news. This is my life, you know what I mean? And that, you know, we are ba we're basically fighting for our rights every single day as indigenous people, fighting to be seen, fighting to be heard. So these are my brothers that you know I really made on set, and they're uh, awesome, amazing people that I actually do um, that work in the movement as well. These are the seven sacred rights um, that that was given to us by Petit Sanwi, a white buffalo calf woman. Um, so basically, I um, I like to include these because this is my dad's teachings of what he likes to talk about. And uh, there's the keeping of the soul, the sweat lodge ceremony, hamblechiapi, wiwangwachipi, hunkhapi, ishnata, tapa wakhanyapi, throwing of the ball, hunkhapi, making relatives. Um, but yeah, you can go to the next slide. <coughs> um, so in 2014, I that was when I started from 2014 to 2020, uh, when COVID happened, I, every year I would go on the Dakota 38 ride. And I'm a Dakota 38 rider for 10 years. And um, basically, the Dakota 38 ride is from Lower Brule, South Dakota to Mankato, Minnesota. We ride in honor and remembrance and wikiksuye of our Lakota, Dakota relatives that were hung in Mankato, that were executed, the largest mass execution in America that had happened. <coughs> this just happened last July. So uh, it was hosted by Oneganos Water Project and River Rocks Youth Group. I was um, basically, uh, I was working with River Rocks Youth Group this whole last summer because they're amazing, talented young youth in this youth group. And they asked me to be a youth lead. And, um, you know, I was working with them for a couple of months and this girl was like, you know, there's this really big grant that I think you should apply for. It's $15,000 for an event that, you know, that you could do anything as. And I applied for it, I added some ideas, you know, and she wrote it up and basically we got it. And um, I didn't think we were gonna get it, but we got it. We got it uh, June, the end of June, and this was July like 30th. And basically, we organized it in a month because I had Sundance in August. So I had to organize it. I flew out people from uh, the Pueblo territory, Aaron Wise, and basically I um, flew out people from Saskatchewan and um, Treaty 6 territory and just to talk about the indigenous, indigenous youth to talk about what they're doing in their communities and how my community can take that from that and how they could write up bright ideas to basically um, share on stage of how they, what they wanna see in their community, how we can improve our lives and our way of life. 
Um, this is a photo that I posted about four years ago. And this was at the Ponca City uh, rally in Oklahoma in 2019. And so this photo went viral. Uh, it got like over 8,000 shares because my, so my cousin went missing and murdered in 2019 as well. And I was doing a lot of advocacy work and it was a pipeline and um, basically, it was a pipeline against, uh, it was no pipeline and missing and murder indigenous rally. So we put on our black hands basically to, um, that's the oil corporation hushing us. So basically, that's what we do. That's what we did. And I just posted it. I didn't even think about it. I didn't even have Wi-Fi like after. Um, I didn't even have Wi-Fi and I just checked it again. And basically we were, um, it went viral. I really didn't expect that. Um, so yeah, this is the Fort Laramie Treaty ride. It was actually, uh, this was four years ago. I was actually able to be a staff carrier and we rode from South Dakota to Wyoming. And this was the first treaty that the Lakota had made with our uh, the government. And basically, um, it was one of the hardest rides because it was so hot. It was in July. And um, I, me and my one horse, my trusty horse, rode that thing the whole way. It was a month. And I, I like to talk about it. This is awesome because riding a whole ride is honestly such hard work. Getting up every day at 6 a.m., feeding your horse, making sure you're fed, your people are fed, and your horse is fed is what like pretty it's hard you know what i mean and i was like i think i was uh 18 but like i'm really proud of that because i just ho rode one horse that whole way and me and my horse were just like doing really great and i just reminisce it and i got in a car accident so like i like to look back at this photo because i can't ride like i used to um i broke my back in a car accident two years ago um but basically i um, I like to talk about it, my rides, my riding experience, because um, it just brings back so much good memories with my people. And um, basically, my c so my cousin went missing and murdered in 2018, and that second one went mis uh, murdered in 2019. So um, in 2019, I had a... Um, Um, I had a event that had happened uh, on Indigenous Peoples Day, and basically, um, I did that, and like over 400 people came, and it was actually, I didn't expect such a good outcome, but like a lot of people, a lot of Indigenous youth don't really organize these things, so when people do hear about it, they want to go and support, and I was able to tell my cousin's stories about how they went missing and murdered. And I talked about um, how, like, the it's called Drag the Red that they had in Winnipeg. And it's basically this boat that went across um, one of the lakes, and they found five uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women's bodies. And they've been doing that ever since. So I just basically shared the st statistics that there are um, actually real, <laughs> there's serial killers out there that are targeting our Indigenous women, and that we all need to take caution and, and you know, be protected. Um, so yeah, that was actually taken at Standing Rock. So I'm going to be closing up now. Thank you so much for listening um, and for listening to my story. Yeah, um, thank you all so much. Sego se guego makashin yet skinny kahagani wa gohin jode wa gato huni six nations nido wageno. I'm from Six Nations Territory, I'm Mohawk and Lakota. I um, am going for my combined degree in Indigenous Studies and Sociology at McMaster University, so hopefully I'll be graduating by the end of the next semester. And um, I am a graduate of Oholoko Youth Rites of Passage, which is a four-year commitment to my uh, mother's side's rites are passage, and so you learn different things every other Sunday, like how to make a canoe, how to um, how to take care of your body, and how to protect your energy, and basically how to um, go through life as a woman and try to 
um, like take care of your body and your mind and your energy and, and learn different skills. And um, I also went through my rites of passage on my father's side, and that's my Ishnati and throwing the ball ceremony. So one happens before you're a woman, and then one happens after, and that's about a four-year commitment too. Um, and I also have been a sun dancer since I was around 12 years old, and that's no eating or drinking for uh, four days each year and praying for um, the water and everything, uh, my people, praying for everything that I could possibly um, think of and that needs help. And so um, I I think that's in, that's mostly what I do. And I wear a lot of hats within my community and a water protector. So a lot of people ask me, like, when did you want to become and start becoming an activist? And I don't think that I always respond like that's not a title that I usually like to go by. It's more so a responsibility to my people. And so it's within our both of my nation's uh, teachings to take care of the water on my mother's side and on my father's side because women are connected to the water uh, in different ways um, for with our moon cycles and the currents and the tides of the moon from um, from a baby being in our tummies and um, and it's surrounded by water which is the amniotic fluid and so that relationship has been there ever since we were all in our mom's tummies. So everybody in this whole entire room has been surrounded by water, and, and, and water is all of our first environments. And so we have to reciprocate that relationship to protect the water like it protected us and nourish the water like it nourished us and continue that because that water will always be there and always protect our future generations. And, um, and not only within the womb, but also within our bodies because we're like 70% water and our brain's like 80% water. And um, just knowing all of this and then praying for the water um, and praying that, that the waters are healthy is really what started what started this water journey. And really it's not a matter of that's what I want to do one day. It's a matter of our responsibility and where I seen that I was needed the most. And especially within my community of Six Nations. Um, so this is, uh, as a Mohawk and Lakota woman, it's our duty to uphold our laws and f for the future generations and to live, to live, your nation is only as strong as the women holding it up. So these uh, strong women who are beside me, the one in the further back, her name is Dr. Bev Beverly Jacobs, and she's a Mohawk lawyer. And so she's, um, she's the one who has helped um, the, ac the actions and um, has been the, like, the legal stance behind the actions fighting against Nestle and Blue Triton. The two um, women in the front are faith keepers and as a faith keeper and a clan mother. And faith keepers and clan mothers w in our nation are really the, the backbone of our nation and they hold a lot of power within our governance. And so we have chiefs and clan, and clan mothers and they are the same and they look out for our clans and our people. And so they've been a strong hold in the backbone of all of the actions and um, and they're really important to saving our water within Six Nations. You can go to the next one. Um, so I come from a long line of chiefs on my father's side and a long line of strong um, Mohawk women on my mother's side, and um, a strong and our and on my um, Six Nations Mohawk side, our society is matriarchal, 
And so that means that we follow our mothers and our mothers um, like have a, I guess a strong, um, strong place within our families and our communities. And I've been in the rites of passage for four years and um, in the four years, what the rites of passage is, is that you pick um, like two aunties and two uncles. And so you learn from those aunties and uncles throughout that year. So if an auntie um, like bees really well or makes baskets really well or conducts herself really well, something that you really want to learn and have with you as a tool throughout your lifetime, then you get to learn from them for that year. So you pick four different aunties and four different uncles and they guide you and throughout that year, and that's how the rites of passage works. And when you're in your first year, you learn, um, and then at the end you fast for how many years that you're at. So at the end of the first year, you fast for one day, second year, two days, three years, three days, four years, four days. And when you're at your fourth year, you can go down. Um, oh, this is one of our teachings and one of our days that we learned. So the women, um, well, first the men, they make a like a garden bed out of a woman's body, a shape of a woman's body, so that they learn how to tend to women. And they know how to um, respect women. And they know that women grow, that they give life, they, that, they, that they're life givers. And so there's this whole teachings that you have to respect women. And so that's really taught to the young, the young men. And then the women plant different things, um, like strawberries and, um, and, and corn and beans and squash and different things, um, because that's also from our creation story. You can go down. Um, so when you're at the, so like I said that at when you're at, when you're done graduating, so like you're, you just got done your four day fast, no food or water, all by yourself, in the woods, it's this is the time that you really get to analyze your life and get to know what you want to do with your time and energy. Who do you want to be in your community? What kind of things do you want to accomplish? And um, also, like, it's work through things that that need to be worked on. Like, if you need, um, like, if something traumatic happened in your life and you really need to think about it. There's not a lot of times where we get to have four days just to ourselves to think about what do we want and um, how are we going to work through these things and be alone with your own thoughts. And that was one of the hardest things for me was just being alone because I'm not, I don't really like to be alone. And so for me, being out there um, in the bushes all alone in the dark, it was really a struggle for me sometimes to to understand that, um, that like I don't need somebody with me. And so what I learned was that I'm never really alone because there's water outside. There's the ground and there's the grass and there's the bugs and the ants and there's the squirrels and the everything outside. And there's the trees who are so ancient and they probably know so much more um, than I can think of, and we can learn from those things and build relationships. And so, those I learned to reconnect to the earth and the water, and to know that I'm never really alone if I'm outside and um, not having a person next to me. And um, so, this is the four day at the when we graduate our four day fast and. We get our aunties to build, to make us a nice new white buckskin, and the men wear their nice, nice new gustoas and buckskin, um, buckskin uh, regalia. And we travel down the river. We, after we get done, we go into like a sweat, and um, and then we change, and then we get so we get sang out of the woods from from our aunties and our families, and they were brought to the riverbank, and then we're sung by the men, and um, by the men, and we 
get into the canoe and they all sing us down the river. Oh, you can go back to the one, go one back like this. And so when we go down this river journey, and then you can go forward again. Uh, one more time. So when we get down to this uh, journey, all of our family are sitting and our community are sitting at the riverbank. And there's lots of us, so we have lots of family. And so it's almost like our whole, f whole community is there for us. And this is really important, I think, like this whole um, community being there for our our young men, our young wi our young wi men and women, um, and so we're sung on from the canoe onto the riverbank until we all sit down in the circle, and then you can go forward. Oh, you can't really see that, but this is the part where we all sit in a circle, and our clan mothers and our chiefs greet us, and then we're. Um, then we're asked to come up one by one, one by one, and or given wampum, and then we are um, acknowledged that we have graduated and we did our four-day fast, and that um, you know celebrating us, and then we're brought up one by one to deliver our message. If we have a message that we learned from all the four years or just within that four days fast. If we had a vision, if we had a dream, if we had some kind of message to the people that we want um, our, and want our voices to be heard. And so the clan mothers and the chiefs and the community all stand around in a circle and that's the chiefs that and the clan mothers like um, on the left side there. And they're listening to us and so they we tell them our dreams and our messages and our lessons or anything that that we want them to hear and the community to hear. So this is like really Im important because it's validating that our voices are heard and that our voices are strong and they're they're valuable. And this is also where they, they have different messages for our community. Like if um, if something's happening and we need to protect the water or we need to protect the land or we need to watch what we eat, um, like going back to our traditional foods of uh, like wild game and stuff like that. You can go down. Um, so this is me when I graduated. i super skinny <laughs> oh, right there. <laughs> but I um, graduated with like uh, my same clan and um, it was really a great celebration. It's a it's a, an amazing feeling to be heard, and because right, right after you get out of this, you feel like that you can do anything. Like you just last at, by yourself, four days, um, in the bushes with no food or water, and it was so hard. Like I don't even know what time it was. I don't know if they were coming to get me today or tomorrow. I lost track of time, and you can really. Um, like have a struggle with your mind, so you just learn to have a strong mind, um, which is important through life. Go ahead. You can go ahead. Um, my brother already kind of covered this, and this is on my father's side. Um, we uh, ride for about two weeks, and it is really, really stren strenuous. And this, I think this was the last time that I actually rode because it was so hard. <laughs> I just really thought my insides were going to, like come out of my body because we were just trotting all day for like two weeks. So it was really um, hard on the body. But it's is just to remember um, the the Cody, I mean <laughs> the Coda 38 <laughs> plus two. Um, that the chiefs that were hung by Abraham Lincoln and we ride from one place all the way up to the memorial place to remember what happened because and to not forget what happened um, so it's an honoring and and also we ride across our own uh, territory and our own land you can go ahead um, this was uh, shortly after sun dancing it's the kind of the only picture that I ever have and um, and this is like like I said where I learned to take care of the water and to pray for the water. 
and give it your heart and your mind and your soul to give it all and for the survival of the water. And that's um, no eating or drinking and dancing from, from dawn till dusk every day in the South Dakota hot summer, which is like over 100 degrees. So it's like oven. And so it, it's super hard. And sometimes I just didn't think that I was, I thought I was going to die. I thought I wasn't going to make it. Um, but you just last run one round by another. And it's just, and I've just been doing that and like praying so hard for the future generations and for the water and for the land. Um, this is just a, uh, um, a connection, just to like to point out the connection to the horses, and then to, um, and then that we ha ride the horses on the land, and so we take care of the land and um, and the horses and the future generations. And this is where really um, like strong relationships connect, and it's really important, especially to um, my Lakota people for because there's a lot of unhealthy relationships, and so this is a place to build healthy relationships and and um, have a healthy place. Go ahead. Um, this is when I, this is a protest that I uh, set up for the first time. I think that was the first time. Yeah, the first time um, against Nestle because they were taking 3.6 million liters out of our aquifer water um, without our, um, consent and um, so when I first found out about this it was the same time I was on my mother's project and I learned that only 10% of our community of Six Nations is hooked up to the water treatment plant and we have the largest um, amount of people within Canada on one reserve um, largest population and there's a lot of families that don't have any access to any running water any um, within their households and this is outrageous because we're right beside all kinds of communities and all kinds of cities that have no problem with running water and so it's why why is six nations having these problems and the community the community like two two minutes away can have water no problem and um and then we are also find out there's contaminants in our tap water there's five different um, heavy metals within our tap water and and then I also learned that that's what Nestle was doing and they only um, paid for a permit of $500 a year and um, and extracted our water basically for pennies and making millions and billions off of it um, and then on the other side I was at the I got um, selected at, from the United Nations um, Global Indigenous Youth Council to do the uh, opening for the climate summit um, at the United Nations in New York City. And I kind of realized that it was a little bit of a tokenism place that I was, I was being a little bit tokenized because there was nobody in that room that was indigenous that were making the big decisions and um, had any kind of voice. They were all from different places and excluding indigenous peoples. And so I realized this and they just kind of wanted a beautiful ceremony just to open up the, the, um, the summit and without any indigenous peoples there. So I made a point to bring my uh, chinupa, my pipe and do a ceremony. And, and I s told everybody that this is not, um, this is not a show. This is my real uh, pipe, and these are real prayers, and these are real things that need to happen. And so I brought my smudge in, which there was never any smudge ever in that room before. And um, and I said, and I kind of grilled Nestle, and I said Nestle was taking our water, and we need to pay attention to um, indigenous peoples and uh, a few things along those lines. So I took it as an opportunity. You go ahead. Um, so, less than 30% of the population across uh, this water directly through, oh, I don't really know what that says. Um, so, <laughs> uh, Canada is in a water crisis, wearing twice the 
are warming the twice the amount of the rest of the globe. Two days ago, the Inuit found petro fuel in their tap water aquifer. Water must be protected at all costs because it's a rare, non-renewable resource. So once aquifer water is taken out of the aquifer, it's never going to come back uh, because water aquifer water takes about five, like thousand years, ten thousand years to get there. Um, so it's a non-renewable -renew source. Go ahead. Um, so I also have a show called Oneganos Let's Talk Water, and I um, and there's about 30 episodes, and um, anybody can go on there on YouTube and look up Oneganos Let's Talk Water and use it as a resource because we have scientists and grandmothers and youth um, and grassroots youth talking about their different um, their different actions and how you can help. So. Um, so you, anybody can use that, and you can use it for a paper or um, anything that you'd like. You can go on. And I also won a David Suzuki Award for it. Go ahead. Um, this is just another uh, protest that we um, set up because after Nestle um, moved out of, Blue, out, out of the territory, we thought it was a short win, and then Blue Triton came, which is like a stock firm, and took their place. And so now we're fighting Blue Triton. You can go ahead. Um, and so these are the two cease and desist letters that uh, Dr. Beverly Jacobs wrote up, and the clan mothers helped me deliver to um, Nestle. And so there was, that was at the protest, and we ordered them a cease and desist on behalf of the Confederacy, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and there was a lot of um, cops and a lot of SUVs and the grandmothers just said that this is our land and this is the this is the water that we're protecting for future generations and we have every right to be here and so we handed them the cease and desist and then after that we um, uh, they moved out and Blue Triton came in and we gave Blue Triton a cease and desist and um, that time you can go forward you can go forward um, that time they, we gave them a, I walked, we walked up the laneway, we went into this foyer, and I picked up the phone, and I dialed the head person, and I said that I'm leaving the hard copy here um, of the cease and desist and the, and the moratorium, and um, the, it'll be, it's delivered on the behalf of Confederacy. And you can go forward. Um, and after that, they, on their website said that they had no concerns from any of the indigenous communities because we didn't white write on their website and so they totally disregarded any of the actions and any of the cease and desist that was delivered to them and now we're um, moving forward with legal action and that's what's happening right now and you can go forward um you can go forward and that's all yeah <laughs> Thank you, Kasha. Okay, so we're gonna switch over. It was emailed to that, that laptop. Yeah. Oh, one second, sorry. So uh, Cody has to leave quickly because he has a meeting for work and uh, he's taking our presentation laptop. So we're going to switch over here in a little bit and then Erin's going to go on to her presentation.
looks like we got it figured out. So Aaron Wise is Hikaria Apache Nation uh, from the Pueblo of Laguna. Uh, she is a non-binary community advocate. Uh, she's been uh, working and engaging with youth on direct action activities and social justice for a number of years. Uh, she's all, they have also uh, worked with youth leaders and grassroots organizers and have earned national awards such as the 2018 Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award, which was shared with United We Dream, The Color of Change, and March for Our Lives. So I'd like to turn it over to Aaron Wise. Thank you. Hold on, y'all. I forgot my notepad. Good morning. How are you? Are you awake? Are you alive? Have you said hi to other people that are here? Have you said thank you to Creator? Have you drank water? <laughs> okay, here I am. Hi. Um, I'm going to keep my mask on because COVID still freaks me out. And uh, I distributed with my last organization about 235 pieces of personal protective equipment during the pandemic. So uh, just going to be here. If y'all can't hear me, you can raise your hand. Um, Good morning, uh, Dunjo uh, Goatsi. My name is Erin Wise. I come, as James said, from the Hickory Apache Nation in Pueblo of Laguna. I flew here yesterday after a car accident from Albuquerque, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, this is me. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I wouldn't be here. I just want to call in really quickly uh, my grandmothers who have helped me do this work my entire life. Um, Ayola Bigay and Miriam Kachucha. On either side is my mother, Francine Kachucha, um, and they are the reason that I am, so I want to give thanks to them. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, my water advocacy work, because we're here talking about water. Uh, my territory is at the base of the Colorado Rockies uh, in the Four Corner area in the United States, and in 2015, the Environmental Protection Agency unleashed about 235,000 gallons of toxic mine waste from a, a vacant uh, dormant mine into a major river near my territories that also runs through the uh, Diné Nation, also known as the Navajo Nation. Um, and so you can see what happened. Um, that was the river before. That was the river afterward. Um, what led me to the work that I'm doing now was this spill. Um, my nieces and nephews couldn't go into the water safely. Uh, actually, the EPA knew that they had released this toxic mine waste into our waterways, and they didn't tell anybody for over 24 hours, so no one shut off their well intakes. So the wells took in all of this poisoned water. Um, the animals got sick, and what ended up happening um, was that the EPA then sent recycled oil tankers full of water, um, specifically to the Navajo Nation, who were the most heavily impacted nearby. And they told folks, you know, we brought water for you, so don't worry, you know, we'll fix it, we'll figure it out, here's some water. Um, the Navajo Nation president at the time went up to the spigot, had a, you know, glass of water. He poured some water into the cup and the water separated from the oil. Um, they said, okay, 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 sorry, sorry, we messed up. You know, obviously not for you. Give it to your livestock, right? For people that are heavily dependent on uh, their more than human kin that they live with for multiple um, sources or um, multiple sources of income, uh, they they didn't have anything. So what happened was uh, at the time, I mobilized with my community to provide uh, water to specifically one chapter house, uh, the Shiprock chapter house, for one year. Uh, to make sure that they had water to distribute. Granted, we don't like giving away plastic water bottles, but there was also nowhere for us to put water if it came any other way. And given that the water had been delivered to them in oil tankers that had been recycled, no one really wanted to accept bulk water, which is fair. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so 2015 segued into 2016. Um, I'm not going to talk to y'all about Standing Rock. I'm sure that most of y'all know what happened, know what it is. Um, it was kind of my jumping off point as a media coordinator and also a caretaker for the International Indigenous Youth Council, which at the time had not been formed um, and was still many of the Ocheti Shikoyan youth and allies that had started the movement that ran from Standing Rock to Washington, D.C. because Obama had come to their territories and said, I love you like my children. I love you. I care for you. I want to take care of you. And then so they ran, right? 
who do you go to when you're hurt? You go to your parents. You go to somebody that's taking care of you. Okay, well, these kids knew that they were going to be hurt, and they ran. We know what happened. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline is active. It is leaking. Um, and this was kind of where I guess I started my uh, less background coordination and more of my public-facing I don't even want to say um, activism, more advocacy, right? Because at the beginning, I talk about my grandmothers who led me into this work, my grandmothers who were the heads of all the departments <laughs> at a time on our reservation. So I could walk into any office, and I knew my grandma was the HBIC no matter where I went. Um, if y'all don't know what that means, I'm sorry to the elders in advance when you find out. Next slide. <laughs> Okay, so after Standing Rock, um, I left and I went back to the Twin Cities. I was raised in uh, the Twin Cities for a time. I speak more Anishinaabe and more Lakota than <laughs> I do Hikaria and Keris. Um, and this picture here is um, a photo of an action that uh, some youth that I mentor did um, with me as well for a time. Uh, they rode in kayaks from the headwaters of the Mississippi, 250 miles to another uh, location, Big Sandy Creek, uh, where there had been a massacre of Anishinaabe people. Um, and the youth, uh, at times, carried their fully loaded canoes through the marshes, um, through waterways where there was no water. And uh, they were doing it, as some of them as young as seven, um, were uh, doing this to fight uh, the Enbridge pipeline, TC Energy pipeline, which uh, was renamed from the Sandpiper to Line 3. Um, if you keep going, these are some of the youth that I got to work with. Um, part of my favorite thing that I love about doing the work that I do is that I get to be an auntie. As James said, I'm non-binary, I'm queer. Um, I unwittingly came out to all the clan mothers in Six Nations <laughs> when I was at their language school. So now you all get to know too. Um, and I'm really actually proud of the work that we were able to achieve. If you can go to the next slide. Um, the youth that led the paddle then showed up with me um, in-house at the Minnesota State Capitol. Um, that was right after our banner had been taken. We had dropped a huge banner and um, actually were calling out the lawmakers that were at the time deciding whether or not they were going to give TC Energy the permits that they now have to operate Line 3. Continue. Um, my work from Standing Rock and Line 3 has led me into y'all's territory. I'm really thankful to be in Treaty 6. Um, the last time I was here, we were having a big a uh, action outside of the Enbridge offices in Calgary. If you go to the next slide. It's actually where I met uh, Ariel Deranger for the first time uh, with their son, which was uh, really special for me because they were somebody that I had admired, and I hope you go see their keynote uh, later. Um, but this was the group of indigenous folks that showed up to the Enbridge office to say that we weren't going to allow Line 3 to happen. Um, one of the biggest things that I see um, as an advocate is that a lot of folks in the states focus on pipelines uh, and not on the head of the snake, right? Um, the oil comes from Canada. It's gone through y'all's territories. It's destroyed your home communities. I don't need to tell you that. I personally feel that everyone down south needs to make their way up north. Uh, so that we can start actually doing some critical work here. Next slide. Um, Y'all got to hear Cody and Makasha, who are my little brother and sister, two of my favorite people ever. Um, I've watched Cody go from being the kid who showed up at our year in Standing Rock asking if we wanted to help make portable toilets, like it was a fun thing, um, <laughs> to the person that he is now. And Makasha going from being the quietest person I'd ever met and the most beautiful to being the leader that she is. And um, these photos are from the Nestle March that she led, um, one of her first actually, where um, we marched down the laneway towards the Nestle plant and actually um, walked out some of the waters that and the truckers that had uh, taken some of the water from Six Nations. And then on the right um, is just a photo. And I'm only sharing these things because it's important to me that when you're doing advocacy work that you ground yourself in the community that you're in um, and that you're working with and that you just don't helicopter in and then helicopter out. So the work that I've been doing specifically with Six Nations has been happening for the last seven years almost. And I feel really thankful for the opportunity. Um, like I said, uh, the right side is a photo of me in the uh, Gawaneo, am I saying that right? Gawaneo uh, Language School. Uh, I thought my Auntie Dawn was gonna like 
melt into her chair because I unwittingly got up in front of all the clan mothers and was like, I'm gay. And, uh, <laughs> and I will take care of all of your kids. I don't know if I'll have any of my own. And um, a sweet thing that happened actually was afterwards about seven youth came out to me privately because they had seen that their clan mothers were going to love them, weren't going to change, were going to like support them. We're going to respect them. And one of the biggest conversations that we continually have is how gender fluid our earth is. Um, as communities, it is respected in a uh, very binary that there are uh, male and female um, roles, that there are male and female representations in nature. And I acknowledge and respect that. Um, being a gender fluid, expansive, person who identifies as non-binary, who has always been everything and too much of it. Um, I look at nature and I am so proud because it is trans. Um, water is fluid. It changes to be what it needs to be. Nature changes. I mean, the, the sex of nature changes all the time depending on how it needs to adapt and grow and burgeon beyond what it's been. Um, so I feel really proud when I have the opportunity as an auntie and as a sister um, to show up as a big sibling for other youth and in spaces where I no longer have my grandmothers to be accepted by grandparents who see me as I am and who don't try to change me for that. Because uh, when they give me that respect and honor, it allows me to be a pillar for young people who are following behind and to learn how to leave the ladder down for them. Uh, next slide, please. I don't know if this is gonna play with video or with sound. You can try. Is there any sound? If not, um, it's okay. I'll just tell you what's going on. Okay, um, so I'm a storyteller. Um, you could just play it. That's all right. Um, I, <laughs> like I said, I was raised by my grandmothers, and so I've always um, been in a place of telling a story or hearing a story, right? There's no in between. You're either listening and learning, or you're learning how to teach. Um, I'm really thankful that I've had the opportunity to do both and that I'm still learning. Um, as James said, he talked about us as youth. Um, I'm 32, but looking around the room, I definitely still very feel very young, um, even when I feel older. Um, this video that I produced um, with my last organization was done on Mauna Kea in 2019. Um, and the reason that I produced this video in particular was to talk about the importance of trans and queer folks in our movement spaces. Um, particularly because when Mauna Kea happened, do you all have an idea about this? I'd raise your hand, do you know what Mauna Kea is? Okay, small handful. Great, so I'll just tell you. Um, the sovereign nation of Hawaii, right, it's a sovereign kingdom. They never ceded their land, the United States took it. Um, currently, still, there is um, the threat of the construction of a telescope called the TMT on their largest mountain. And all of them decided uh, as a nation that they didn't want that to happen. And what they did was like, unlike any other movement space I've ever been in, they set up a college and they invited teachers to come back to teach about the language, teach about cultural rights, to teach uh, meles, to teach the songs, right, so that we could all sing together because our voice is stronger in song sometimes than it is in speaking. Um, they taught dances. They invited people from you know, all over the globe that came and actually taught and held space. And this person speaking right now is a trans person, and they're speaking about the importance of um, trans and queer people during this movement because when they were first starting construction and when they were first threatening it, um, the very first people that ran up the mountain were queer and trans and were putting their bodies on the line to say no more. Um, so the importance of this video mostly is uh, just to talk about the fact that there are queer and trans people in your movement spaces. Um, obviously, like, right, I have, I have curly hair, I have makeup on, everybody thinks I'm a woman. Um, it's not how I identify. I don't disrespect anybody that thinks otherwise, but a lot of people don't know when they're talking about people that are that way, people that are gay, people that are trans, when they say lesbian, or when they say bisexual, or say things under their breath. Um, that they're probably talking about people that are sitting in the room with them, right? We're the people that are serving you food. We're the ones that are helping you within service industry things. Um, and it's really important to me, at least for our young people more than ever, um, if they're inheriting this world, they need to be seen and recognized and held as space um, for them within it. And it's really important to me that in water advocacy and in land advocacy that we recognize um, that we can't 
continually rely on binary solutions for an expansive issue that uh, impacts, um, you know, as Makasha said, uh, all are more than human kin and we are never truly alone, especially not when we're standing on the land that our, you know, roots grow out of our feet and into the earth. So next slide, please. Can you skip? Skip it. Beautiful. <laughs> Okay, so I'm almost done, and I bless y'all. Okay, that one won't work. We're going to go next. All right. Beautiful. Okay, so that last video that won't play, I wanted to just share with y'all because it's so precious to me. Um, but it was a video of two boys uh, playing drum for me in the Sugarbush camp that they had set up in uh, Potawatomi territory. And they wanted to show me uh, how they sing to the trees to make the sap sweeter. And I think that's really important because the young people don't know exactly what they're doing until we tell them. And the beauty and the insights of what they teach us before we tell them anything is just so invaluable. Um, I put these in here. They're not <laughs> actually a part of my presentation, and I see that she's left. But the last time I saw this grandmother was at the Protecting Mother Earth Conference, and I just really want to lift my hands to her because I know she's done so much incredible work for our communities internationally for so long and earlier when I showed her these photos she held the phone and she said dang I look so cute <laughs> <laughs> so if y'all see her later you just tell her how good looking she is uh, grandma's like to hear it too y'all don't stop flirting with them on <laughs> next slide please okay so I'm going to conclude because I know we're going over um, our time and I'm happy to answer more questions about my personal advocacy the work that I'm currently doing um, I now work with an organization called the Center for Cultural Power, and uh, we disrupt through artist leadership, intersectional storytelling, and field building. If y'all want to look us up um, and stay engaged with the work that I'm currently doing now and the storytelling that I'm doing now, you can do that. Um, and I just want to remind y'all things that you already know. Um, we're only 5% of the world's population, right? At least what they've registered us as. Um, but we safeguard 80% of the world's biodiversity and we're actually taking care of about a quarter of the world's land right now. So those of us that are in this room, we're doing great. And even though um, folks like to project that we're in the age of the Anthropocene, right, that there's this age of extinction that's upon us, our people are smarter than that. Our cultural wisdom teaches us um, more than that, and we actually reach beyond the ways of knowing that have been imposed on us. So I really want to just uplift, um, I believe it was the first speaker who said, um, that you know our traditional knowledge and our traditional wisdom is already here and it's already saving us we just have to tap back and reach into our blood memories that already exist to remember where we've been to know where we're going so i just want to say thank you and um i look forward to speaking and hearing from you all <laughs>